tell me the story of how you and mom met. Oh. Please tell me the story of how you and dad met. Oh, honey, you've heard that a million times. Haven't you heard that a million times? Okay, fine. We were doing a play at the first one act festival of the Ensemble Studio Theater in New York on the Upper West Side. It was 1971. It was April of 1978. We were playing Friends in a play called The Split by Michael Weller. And I said, well, who's in it? Elaine Bromka, Chip Zion, Mandy Patinkin. That kid, Mandy, P what is it, Patinkin? Oh, he's great. Okay, I'll do it. And I always admired him because he dared to be so damn bad. He was so brave. Well, we improvised a scene for over 40 some minutes. And we began to improvise all the things that people say to each other when they're courting and meeting each other. The games they play, the things they say, the body language. It was sort of like, fuck the play. The play was like, you know, not even in our interest anymore. It was sort of like courting for six months in 45 minutes. We did an improv that lasted 45 minutes and the director, Kel Rothman, kept going in and out of the room. Dad always describes that as, you know, getting the first six weeks of dating out of the way. I have no idea what he's talking about. That's not what I felt at all. And so I made a date with her for Sunday morning brunch. She knew that, you know, this was a lunatic. <laughs> you know, that she was even considering talking to. And then after rehearsal that day, Michael Weller came up to me and said, what do you think? of Mandy. I said, oh, he's fabulous. I love working with him. He's great. What, you mean personally, what do I think of it? Oh, forget it, Michael. I said, no way. The next person I'm going to be with is a father of my children, and he is definitely not that. <laughs> and she calls, and we had this talk that seemed to go on for hours. I'm talking to your mom, and, and I'm saying, uh, um, she says something about poetry, and, and reading some kind of feminist poetry that I had no interest in whatsoever. Your father survived this poem. He was 25 fucking years old. You cooked up that rich stew of masochism where we swim. Women are born to suffer, mistreated and cheated. We are trained to that hothouse of exploitation. Never do we feel more alive when we're on our backs waiting for the world to get fucked. Something like that. Dad said, oh, I have a poem. So I pictured this guy with a whole bunch of books of poetry. He had one book of poetry called In the Country of Marriage by Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry called The Country of Marriage. It was a thin book of his poems. It was like the only book I had in the whole apartment. I didn't have anything else. A couple plays I did and this one fucking book of poems. So I said, well, I have this poem I'd like to read. And I, and I read her this book called The Country of Marriage, this poem. One poem. I mean, it had 10 or 12 poems in it. I just read her the poem, The Country of Marriage. I'll never forget the one line that I never could get out of my head to this day. I give you my death to set you free of me. We held hands under the table. And then I went home and I opened the package. And I called him up and I said, Mandy, I love, 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 love the scarf. And I like the blouse. And he said, you hated the blouse, huh? Well, I've never bought clothes for a woman, so I wasn't sure about the blouse, which just completely broke my heart. So we go and have this first brunch at the Black Sheep Tavern on, um, on Washington and I think Greenwich Street in the village. Then we made an arrangement to meet for breakfast and I had to tell him how to get to the village, which he literally did not know how to get to. I thought, I remember thinking, oh man, he's an actor, he's a baby and he doesn't even know how to get downtown. This is gonna be a quick date. This is ridiculous. And he walked into the Black Sheep Cafe, which is no longer there. He came in with a camera and some yellow flowers and said, I have one thing to say before we have breakfast. And I said, what's that? And he said, I'm going to marry you. And I said, oh, well, you're going to get very hurt because I'm not marrying anybody. I don't believe in it. 
And I said, I'm going to marry you. First date. She says, you don't know what you're talking about. You're an actor. And, a, and she goes like this. And I do. And I have that picture to this day. Uh, where she says, you don't know what you're talking about. You're an actor and a baby and you're going to get hurt. I said, it's okay. And then we spent the next hour or two walking along the piers crying, which is pretty bizarre. Makes me believe in other lives. Crying. Dad said the only thing that terrified him more than having a relationship was missing one with me. I said, that's what everybody says when they first meet me. Just wait. <laughs> and, and the moment happens and we have this first kiss, which was incredible. It was long and it was just everything you want a kiss to be. It just felt soft and loving and cradled. And um, like a dream. And then he wanted to get together the next night. And he always says I was making it up and playing hard to get. That was a concept I didn't even have. I was actually busy. I had plans, you know. And uh, that was a Sunday. And the earliest I could see him was Thursday. And it's Sunday, and I said, so can we see each other tomorrow? And she says, I'm busy. Cool, I said. I said, um, how about Tuesday? I have plans, she said. I said, Wednesday, good? I can't. I'm, I'm doing something on Wednesday. And I really thought, like, whoa, man, I guess I read, I guess I read all of this wrong, and I must have missed something. I said, all right, well, let me know when... Uh, you'll be free if you want to get together. I'll, I'm free Thursday, she said. And I thought to myself at that moment, Thursday? I've never waited till Thursday. <laughs> All right, Thursday. And I did a really weird thing. I lemon oiled my wood floors of my village walk up by hand. Why I did that, I'd never done it. I'd lived there for several years. Go figure, you know. I get to the village, Carmen and Bedford Street, and I walk up all these, I think it was a fifth floor walk up, and I went, this is true love. And uh, I walk in and the floors are crystal clean, like she just done them. And then she shows me um, where her sweaters were. I made dinner. He was a little shocked to see my stove that was full of sweaters. Her sweaters were in her oven. And I just went, mm, maybe she's not a cook. <laughs> she, said she doesn't cook a lot. I looked around and it was so personal, the whole place. I'd never seen such a personal touch of a person's life, passions, interests, physical things, fabrics. I'd never seen that to that degree. I grew up in a home where the furniture was covered with plastic slip covers, you know? I wore my most velvet clothes because I thought, oh, this kid's never seen that before. I can guarantee you that. So like velour on the beds and the chairs, and oh my God. And then there were like dates and figs and bowls. I had figs, strawberries, some other fruit. And then he said those holy words where he said, please be patient with me. I've never made love with anybody I've loved before. That was it. That is how we met. And I knew I'd found the girl that I was going to spend the rest of my life with. And we have and it's been up and down and but neither of us were ever willing to quit at the worst of our times and I guess if I had any advice for anybody if there's some instinct you can search out that that possibility might exist at hello 